लाइक शेयर सब्सक्राइब If you enjoy this story and the work that the Black Dog Chronicles does, please consider pushing the thanks button and leaving me a tip. I am extremely grateful for whatever support you can give. Thank you. Girl of my dreams, I love you. Honest I do you are so sweet Mr Loveday's little outing by Evelyn War read for you by Hugh Carr Then life would be complete You will not find your father greatly changed," remarked Lady Moping as the car turned into the gates of the county asylum. "Will he be wearing a uniform?" asked Angela. "No, dear, of course not. He is receiving the very best attention." It was Angela's first visit, and it was being made at her own suggestion. 10 years had passed since the showery day in late summer. when lord moping had been taken away a day of confused but bitter memories for her the day of lady moping's annual garden party always bitter confused that day by the caprice of the weather which remaining clear and brilliant with promise until the arrival of the first guests had suddenly blackened into a squall there had been a scuttle for cover The marquee had capsized. A frantic carrying of cushions and chairs, a tablecloth lofted to the bows of the monkey puzzler, fluttering in the rain. A bright period and the cautious emergence of guests onto the soggy lawns. Another squall, another 20 minutes of sunshine. It had been an abominable afternoon, culminating at about 6 o'clock. in her father's attempted suicide lord moping habitually threatened suicide on the occasion of the garden party that year he had been found black in the face hanging by his braces in the orangery some neighbors who were sheltering there from the rain set him on his feet again and before dinner a van had called for him since then lady moping had paid seasonal calls at the asylum and returned in time for tea rather reticent of her experience many of the neighbors were inclined to be critical of lord moping's accommodation he was not of course an ordinary inmate he lived in a separate wing of the asylum specially devoted to the segregation of wealthier lunatics these were given every consideration which their foibles permitted they might choose their own clothes many indulged in the liveliest fancies smoke the most expensive brands of cigars on the anniversaries of their certification entertain any other inmates for whom they had an attachment to private dinner parties the fact remained however that it was far from being the most expensive kind of institution the uncompromising address county home for mental defectives stamped across the note paper worked on the uniforms of their attendants painted even upon a prominent boarding at the main entrance suggested the lowest associations from time to time with less or more tact her friends attempted to bring to lady moping's notice particulars of seaside nursing homes of qualified practitioners with large private grounds suitable for the charge of nervous or difficult cases but she accepted them lightly when her son came of age he might make any changes that he thought fit meanwhile she felt no inclination to relax her economical regime her husband had betrayed her basely on the one day in the year she looked for loyal support 
and was far better off than he deserved. A few lonely figures in greatcoats were shuffling and loping about the park. Those are the lower class lunatics, observed Lady Moping. There is a very nice little flower garden for people like your father. I sent them some cuttings last year. They drove past the blank yellow brick facade to the doctor's private entrance and were received by him in the visitor's room, set aside for interviews of this kind. The window was protected on the inside by bars and wire netting. There was no fireplace. When Angela nervously attempted to move her chair further from the radiator, she found that it was screwed to the floor. Lord Milpig is quite ready to see you, said the doctor. How is he? Oh, very well. Very well indeed, I'm glad to say. He had rather a nasty cold some time ago, but apart from that his condition is excellent. He spends a lot of his time in writing. They heard a shuffling, skipping sound approaching along the flag passage. Outside the door, a high, peevish voice, which Angela recognized as her father's, said, I haven't the time, I tell you. Let them come back later. A gentler tone, with a slight rural burr, replied, Now come along. It is a purely formal audience. You need stay no longer than you like. Then the door was pushed open, it had no lock or fastening, and Lord Moping came into the room. He was attended by an elderly little man with full white hair and an expression of great kindness. That is Mr. Loveday, who acts as Lord Moping's attendant. Secretary? said Lord Moping. He moved with a jogging gait and shook hands with his wife. This is Angela. You remember Angela, don't you? No, I can't say that I do. What does she want? We just came to see you. Well, you have come at an exceedingly inconvenient time. I am very busy. Have you typed out that letter to the Pope yet, Loveday? No, my lord. If you remember, you asked me to look up the figures about the Newfoundland fisheries first. Oh, so I did. Well, it is fortunate, as I think the whole letter will have to be redrafted. A great deal of new information has come to light since luncheon. A great deal. You see, my dear, I am fully occupied. He turned his restless, quizzical eyes upon Angela. I suppose you have come about the Danube. Well, you must come again later. Tell them it will be all right, quite all right. But I have not had time to give my full attention to it. Tell them that. Very well, Papa. Anyway, said Lord Moping, rather petulantly. It is a matter of secondary importance. There is the Elbe. And the Amazon and the Tigris to be dealt with first, eh, lovely? Danube indeed, nasty little river. I'd only call it a stream myself. Well, can't stop, nice of you to come. I would do more for you if I could, but you see how I'm fixed. Write to me about it, that's it. Put it in black and white. And with that, he left the room. You see, said the doctor, he is in excellent condition. He is putting on weight, eating and sleeping excellently. In fact, the whole tone of his system is above reproach. The door opened again, and Mr. Loveday returned. Forgive my coming back, sir, but I was afraid that the young lady might be upset at his lordship's not knowing her. You mustn't mind him, miss. Next time, he'll be very pleased to see you. It's only today he's put out, on account of being behindhand in his work. You see, sir, all this week I've been helping him in the library, and I haven't been able to get all his lordship's reports typed out. And he's got muddled with his card index. That's all it is. He doesn't mean any harm. What a nice man, said Angela, when Loveday had gone back to his charge. Yes, 
I don't know what we should do without old Loveday. Everybody loves him. Staff and patients alike. I remember him well. It's a great comfort to know that you are able to get such good wardens, said Lady Mooping. People who don't know say such foolish things about asylums. Oh, but Loveday isn't a warder, said the doctor. You don't mean he's cuckoo too, said Angela. The doctor corrected her. He is an inmate. It is rather an interesting case. He has been here for 35 years. But I've never seen anyone saner, said Angela. <laughs> he certainly has that air, said the doctor. And in the last 20 years we have treated him as such. He is the life and soul of the place. Of course, he is not one of the private patients, but we allow him to mix freely with them. He plays billions excellently, does conjuring tricks at the concert, mends their gramophones, ballets them, helps them in their crosswords, puzzles, and various uh, hobbies. We allow them to give him small tips for services rendered, and he must by now have amassed quite a little fortune. He has a way with even the most troublesome of them, an invaluable man about the place. Yes, but why is he here? Well, it is rather sad. When he was a very young man, he killed somebody, a young woman quite unknown to him, whom he knocked off her bicycle and then throttled. He gave himself up immediately afterwards, and has been here ever since. But surely he is perfectly safe now. Why is he not let out? Well, I suppose if it was to anyone's interest, he would be. He has no relatives except a stepsister who lives in Plymouth. She used to visit him at one time, but she hasn't been for years now. He's perfectly happy here, and I can assure you we aren't going to take the first steps in turning him out. He's far too useful to us. But it doesn't seem fair, said Angela. Look at your father, said the doctor. He'd be quite lost without Love Day to act as his secretary. It doesn't seem fair. Angela left the asylum, oppressed by a sense of injustice. Her mother was unsympathetic. Think of being locked up in a loony bin all one's life. He attempted to hang himself in the orange ray replied Lady Moping. In front of the Chester Martins? I don't mean Papa. I mean Mr. Loveday. I don't think I know him. Yes, the loony they have put to look after Papa. Your father's secretary. A very decent sort of man, I thought, and eminently suited to his work. Angela left the question for the time but return to it again at luncheon on the following day. Mums, what does one have to do to get people out of the bin? The bin? Good gracious, child, I hope that you do not anticipate your father's return here. No, no, Mr. Loveday. Angela, you seem to me to be totally bemused. I see it was a mistake to take you with me on our little visit yesterday. After luncheon, Angela disappeared to the library and was soon immersed in the lunacy laws as represented in the encyclopedia. She did not reopen the subject with her mother, but a fortnight later, when there was a question of taking some pheasants over to her father for his eleventh certification party, she showed an unusual willingness to run over with them. Her mother was occupied with other interests and noticed nothing suspicious. Angela drove her small car to the asylum, and, after delivering the game, asked for Mr. Loveday. He was busy at the time, making a crown for one of his companions, who expected Auli to be anointed Emperor of Brazil, but he left his work and enjoyed several minutes' conversation with her. They spoke about her father's health and spirits, after a time, Angela remarked, Don't you ever want to get away? 
Mr. Loveday looked at her with his gentle blue-gray eyes. Oh, I've got very well used to the life, miss. I'm fond of the poor people here, and I think that several of them are quite fond of me. At least, I think they would miss me if I were to go. But don't you ever think of being free again? Oh, yes, miss. I think of it. Almost all the time I think of it. What would you do if you got out? There must be something you would sooner do than stay here. The old man fidgeted uneasily. Well, miss, it, it sounds ungrateful, but I can't deny I should welcome a little outing once before I get too old to enjoy it. Expect we all have our secret ambitions, and there is one thing I often wish I could do. You mustn't ask me what. Wouldn't take long. But I do feel that if I'd done it, just for a day, an afternoon even, then I would die quiet. I could settle down again easier and devote myself to the poor crazed people here with a better heart. Yes, I do feel that. There were tears in Angela's eyes that afternoon as she drove away. He shall have his little outing, bless him, she said. From that day onwards, for many weeks, Angela had a new purpose in life. She moved about the ordinary routine of her home, with an abstracted air and an unfamiliar, reserved courtesy which greatly disconcerted Lady Moping. Oh, I believe the child's in love. I only pray that it isn't that uncouth Edgbertson boy. She read a great deal in the library. She cross-examined any guests who had pretensions to legal or medical knowledge. She showed extreme goodwill to old Sir Roderick Lane Foskett, their member. The name's alienist, barrister, or government official now had for her the glamour that formerly surrounded film actors and professional wrestlers. She was a woman with a cause, and before the end of the hunting season she had triumphed. Mr. Loveday achieved his liberty. The doctor at the asylum showed reluctance but no real opposition. Sir Roderick wrote to the Home Office, the necessary papers were signed, and at last the day came when Mr. Loveday took leave of the home where he had spent such long and useful years. His departure was marked by some ceremony. Angela and Sir Roderick Lane Foskett sat with the doctors on the stage of the gymnasium. Below them were assembled everyone in the institution who was thought to be stable enough to endure the excitement. Lord Moping, with a few suitable expressions of regret, presented Mr. Loveday on behalf of the wealthier lunatics with a gold cigarette case. Those who supposed themselves to be emperors showered him with decorations and titles of honour. The warders gave him a silver watch, and many of the non-paying inmates were in tears on the day of the presentation. The doctor made the main speech of the afternoon. Remember, he remarked, that you leave behind you nothing but our warmest good wishes. You are bound to us by ties that none will forget. Time will only deepen our sense of debt to you. If, at any time in the future, you should grow tired of your life in the world, there will always be a welcome for you here. Your post will be open. A dozen or so variously afflicted lunatics hopped and skipped after him down the drive until the iron gates opened and Mr. Loveday stepped into his freedom. His small trunk had already gone to the station. He elected to walk. He had been reticent about his plans, but he was well provided with money, and the general impression was that he would go to London and enjoy himself a little before visiting his stepsister in Plymouth. It was to the surprise of all that he returned within two hours of his liberation. 
he was smiling whimsically, a gentle, self-regarding smile of reminiscence. I have come back, he informed the doctor. I think that now I shall be here for good. But Lefty, what a short holiday. I'm afraid that you have hardly enjoyed yourself at all. Oh, yes, sir. Thank you, sir. I've enjoyed myself very much. I've been promising myself one little treat all these years. It was short, sir, but most enjoyable. Now I shall be able to settle down again to my work here without any regrets. Half a mile up the road from the asylum gates, they later discovered an abandoned bicycle. It was a lady's machine of some antiquity. Quite near it, in the ditch, lay the strangled body of a young woman, who, riding home to her tea, had chanced to overtake Mr. Loveday as he strode along, musing on his opportunities. You have been listening to Mr. Loveday's Little Outing by Evelyn War, read for you by Hugh Carr, original music by Flunto Blaptimbler, art by Mahimti Peeve. So, what can you expect next time on the Black Dog Chronicles? Well, we've got a classic for you. Edgar Allan Poe's The Pit and the Pendulum. A great story. You won't want to miss it. Tell your friends, gather them together, and let's all watch it together when it premieres live in two weeks' time. Don't forget that the old moon's cat is hidden somewhere in this video. He's lost himself again, and it's up to you to find him. If you spot him, write the time code that he appears in the comments field, and if you get it right, you win the chance to have the story dedicated to you or someone you care about. Did you like the story and the production that we did? Then consider tipping. You can push the thanks button and give anything you like. Whatever you can is greatly appreciated. Well, my friends, I look forward to seeing you next time on the channel for our next great story. Until then, please don't forget... For the shadows. <laughs> <laughs>